Hello, and welcome to the Spring Extravaganza with Polar Bears International. My name is Alisa McCall, and I'm Director of Conservation Outreach at Polar Bears International. And we have a great little panel here today to talk to you about why spring is so special for polar bears. So I think we're all pretty excited that the snow is starting to melt depending on where you are in the world. I know I'm getting excited. The sun's out longer, sunny days are ahead, and polar bears are also excited for their own reasons. And we're gonna talk about a few different ways uh, that they are celebrating the spring right now. So I'd love to introduce our panelists in just a moment, but please a reminder, do send us your questions if you have any. We're gonna keep an eye on them throughout the webcast today. I have a screen next to me with uh, the Facebook and the chat window, so I'm gonna take a look at your questions and pass them on to the panelists as often as I can. So if you wanna know anything about what we're talking about today, please do let us know. And we're gonna talk for about 30 minutes today about polar bears and all that they do in the spring. So let's meet our panelists. Uh, let's start with you, BJ. Can you just introduce yourself and a little bit about what you do? Sure. My name is BJ Kirschhofer, and I'm the director of field operations for Polar Bears International. Uh, I get to spend typically a lot of time in the same place that polar bears live, uh, either doing research or conducting programs like this, our Tender, ne Tender Connections program, uh, talking about polar bears and what you can do to help them. Thanks, BJ. And we are also joined by Anthony. Anthony, can you say hi to the audience? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Pagano. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with Washington State University. Uh, I've spent a bit over 12 years now working on polar bears. I spent 10 years working on polar bears up in Alaska with the U.S. Geological Survey, and now I'm doing research on polar bears in the western Hudson Bay region. With most of my research focused on polar bear movements and energy expenditure and behaviors. Thank you both. We're going to talk about all of those topics today really briefly. But again, if you've got any questions, do send them to us and we can go into more depth about anything you'd like to know about. And again, I'm Lisa. I'm up in Whitehorse, Yukon in Canada. I've also been researching polar bears for about 10 years and now work with Polar Bears International. I'm so excited to host some of these educational programs that we have going on. So let's dive into some cool content right now. So it's April, mid-April. That means a lot of things are happening out on the sea ice, but some thing happened last month and that was that moms with their brand new cubs emerged from their dens for the first time with their new babies so that's a fabulous kind of start of the spring for polar bears and bj i was hoping that you could talk a little bit about den emergence because bj has been working on a den emergence research project for quite a few years now using cameras so i've been super lucky to be able to watch and look at polar bear dens for, I don't know, maybe like the last 10 years. Started in Alaska on the Beaufort Sea, and now we've moved that project to Svalbard, Norway, and we're working with the Norwegian Polar Institute as well as San Diego Zoo. And what we're doing is we're sneaking up on polar bear dens really quietly and putting cameras on in front of those dens to see what comes out. See how big the mom is, see how uh, many cubs come out, how big they are, you know, kind of relative size to each other as well as the mom. We're curious about how long they stick around these den sites, what they do while they're at the den, and, um, you know, when they take off and head for the sea ice. And these cameras, you're seeing images right there of, uh, of the cameras that we're using. That's, that's kind of what we put out in front of the dens. And this is some of the footage that you see. These are cubs that just come out of the den and are probably about to take off for the sea ice. You can see there's two of them here with mom. They're quite small. This They're probably one of the cutest animals in the animal king, kingdom, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, they're just adorable little fur balls. And they're at a really critical time in their life right now. They've just spent, they're born at about a pound inside the den and mom nursed them up to this roughly about 20 pound size um, until they're just big enough to be able to survive the cold temperatures outside of the den. It's quite nice inside the den. It'd be pretty warm with mom in there, very safe because they're hidden from view. And that's very important. And then here's some footage. Once they get to that 20 pound mark, mom has not eaten for a very long time. It's time to go get a meal. She says, come on kids, let's go and uh or something like that anyways and they head off to the sea ice to uh to go catch some seals 
That's so great. Thanks for that, BJ. Yeah, polar bears are a sea ice dependent animal. And in fact, we can consider them a marine mammal. They're so dependent on Arctic sea ice. And it's exactly because of what BJ just said, they need to go hunt seals. And those moms and cubs, they time their emergence from the den with a special time of year that means there's a lot of good eating for polar bears and that's seal pupping. So it's the same time of year when seals are starting to give birth to their pups and the pups are a little bit fatty, but still not very smart and not very fast. So there's a lot of easy eating for polar bears, which means there's a lot of opportunities here. So I'm gonna hop over to Anthony. And Anthony, could you tell us a little bit about the springtime of feeding uh, for polar bears? We sometimes call it hyperphagia. What does that mean? Yeah, so basically hyperphagia means really they're consuming an extreme amount of, of food. And so polar bears are unique among the bears in, in certainly North America, like black bears and brown bears that would um, basically all of them go into dens and hibernate through the winter. For polar bears, the adult males, uh, the females with cubs, the subadults, they stay out on the sea ice um, throughout the winter. They're moving around, they're, they're doing some hunting, even though it's, it's dark all day long. Somehow they're moving around in the dark um, and it's, it can get down to negative 30, negative 40 degrees. And, and what we see is that they're able to, to basically occasionally catch seals uh, based on their changes in their body weight. Um, but they're still getting down to basically their lowest weight by the time March rolls around. And so it's really that time in the spring that becomes really essential for them to put on the the body fat and the mass that they need to, to sustain themselves for the rest of the year. And so they're really becoming very active in this in the start of the spring. As you said, the seals start having their pups and the polar bears um, start, start hunting quite actively. Um, particularly using their sense of smell, they'll, they'll roam on the sea ice looking for seal layers. So the, the ring seals will give birth in uh, these layers of snow that, that where snow accumulates on the ice. And the polar bears will locate these layers by, by their sense of smell. Um, and then they'll pounce on top of, of a layer and dig into it and, and try to extract the, the ring seal pup and sometimes even catch um, the adult seal as well. And they can basically double their body mass um, through through this hunting um, method that they've that they've evolved. Um, so a, an adult female in the spring can typically be around um, 180 kilograms or um, close to about um, 350 or 400 pounds. And by the time um, the spring and the early summer is over, they can basically double that and be, be closer to about um, 360 kilograms or, or almost 800 pounds. And so they're, they're really putting on a, a huge amount of weight over a, a pretty short period of time, over just a couple of months. That is totally incredible. How much can polar bears eat at one sitting? Like if you just piled up some seal blubber in front of them, I mean, it would depend on the bear, but they must be able to eat a lot at one time. Yeah, they can consume a, an amazing amount of food. So um, it's been found that they can eat about 10% of their, their body mass in about 30 minutes. So for um, an adult female, that'd be um, almost about 40 pounds. Um, or close to 20 kilograms uh, of food in, in 30 minutes. Um, and they're, the females are typically catching ring seals and they'll, they'll eat an entire ring seal in the course of a, of a couple hours. And what I've seen is, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll catch a seal, they'll eat it, and then they go right back to hunting in the spring and they'll go out and, and try to catch more seals. And if they, they do catch them, they'll, they'll start eating those right away as well. Wow, seal blubber really is the polar bear's favorite food. Some scientists even call them lipovores instead of carnivores because they really will just eat as much blubber as they can and even leave the meat in times when hunting is really good. If you can imagine a human eating 10% of their body weight in 30 minutes, so if you had a male that was 180 pounds eating 18 pounds of food in half an hour, that would probably break some world records or at least get them up there as some world eating champion. That is absolutely crazy, but it makes sense for polar bears. You have to eat when the eating's good. So Anthony has done some very cool work looking at polar bear metabolism and how polar bears burn energy. 
Because when we're looking at polar bear health and populations and reproduction, so much of that comes down to energy balance. So what are polar bears taking in and how much energy are they expending? Because for any animal out there, if you're burning a lot more than you're eating, over time, you're gonna be maybe less healthy, smaller, not reproduce as well if you don't have the amount of calories you need. And Anthony has had some very incredible findings with polar bear metabolism. And Anthony, I think we've learned that polar bears actually burn more energy than we even thought before. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So. Um, we, we are always knew that polar bears need a lot of energy, um, in particular to, to really sustain themselves. So like I said, they put on uh, a huge amount of fat in, in the spring through this, this foraging pattern that they have in the spring where they're catching lots of seals. And then they go through this period, um, really through the fall and winter where they're, where they have very little access to seals. Um, and what my research has found is that they they actually have a, a higher energy expenditure, so they um, they need more calories than what we previously thought. Um, what I've found is that on average, an an adult female needs about um, twelve thousand calories per day um, to to um, to uh, meet their energy demands. So that's about six times um, what a, a typical person would would need to to eat. So they, they have a, a really high energy demand um, and they're really reliant on, on catching these seals to, to meet the, that energy demand. Like you said, these seals are, are really high in blubber, which provides uh, a lot of energy that, that these bears need to, to sustain themselves. Anthony, uh, we have a couple really cool clips of ways that we learn more about polar bear energy and metabolism because it's very difficult to study how polar bears are burning energy out in the wild. I mean, they're out in the wild. They're out on the sea ice and hunting and eating pretty far away from humans. So we can take opportunities uh, to work with some fabulous zoo partners to help us learn a bit more about polar bear metabolism. And I believe we have a couple clips of both a swim flume and a treadmill. And I was wondering if you could talk to the audience a bit about what they're going to see here. Yeah, yeah, that, you're, you're exactly right. So polar bears are certainly one of the most remote um, mammals that, that exist on the planet as far as trying to study them um, and the environment that they're in. And so we worked with um, the Oregon Zoo and the San Diego Zoo. Um, we built this metabolic swim flume at the Oregon Zoo. One of the things that we're seeing with, with climate change is an increase in swimming frequency of polar bears as they're encountering more open water than existed in the past. And so we built this um, chamber that um, the bears were, were trained to, to voluntarily swim in. They'd get a, a food reward from the keepers and um, we can measure their oxygen consumption while they're swimming within this flume. And it provides us a, a measure of what it's costing these bears to swim. Um, one of the questions we have as, as bears are increasingly swimming is, is what does that mean for their energy expenditure? How well are they doing at, at, at meeting that energy expenditure? And as we look forward with increasing amounts of open water in the Arctic, um, how are bears going to respond? Um, how much more food are they going to need? And then the other thing that we did was actually um, measure their energy expenditure while they're walking um, to be able to compare to their cost of swimming. And so we built a, a metabolic treadmill um, that uh, was basically a modified um, treadmill designed for horses. And we similarly built this chamber. The bear was, again, trained voluntarily to come into this chamber. She'd get a food reward um, from the keepers and we could similarly measure the oxygen consumption. So the bear's breathing in this chamber and we're basically measuring how much oxygen is changing in that chamber as she's exercising. Very similar to if you've seen kind of commercials with somebody, a person with a mask over their face. Um, it's a very similar concept. And basically what, what we did with that is we used sort of a Fitbit style concept where uh, if you've seen somebody that has a, a Fitbit um, it provides a measure of energy expenditure as you're exercising, and we can basically use that same idea, apply it to um, devices, collars that we're putting on bears in the wild, and actually measure their energy expenditure in the wild. 
That's so fantastic and such an excellent example of why we need engineers in the field of conservation and biology and all sorts of people that think creatively. And just to reiterate, those polar bears are doing this voluntarily and they really do have a great time doing it. They love learning new things, trying out uh, new opportunities. It makes them think and they get food rewarded for helping us learn a lot more about their species and helping us apply that knowledge to their wild cousins. So thank you for that explanation. Very, very cool footage. So we have talked about spring already. We've talked about den emergence with moms and cubs. We've talked about hyperphagia, gorging on food. And there's another special thing that happens in the spring. And that is, of course, mating, which happens with any animal, many animals in the wildlife kingdom, of course. So we're going to throw this over to BJ to talk a little bit about polar bear mating. Um, one question that always comes up is polar bears are spread over the entire Arctic, basically. They have a massive, massive range. And the sea ice is always moving. It's breaking up and moving and polar bears are swimming and walking. How on earth do they even find each other out on the sea ice, BJ? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you can kind of see an example of sea ice right here behind my head. This is, this sea ice isn't perfect polar bear habitat by any stretch, but imagine trying to find your friends out on a landscape that's breaking up, moving around, blowing in the wind. Uh, not to mention the food you want to eat. I mean, this is a really challenging environment. Here's another great example. I mean, just trying to find somebody out here would be impossible. So uh, polar bears have evolved to have a pretty neat, uh, uh, almost like homing beacon, if you will, to be able to find uh, different bears. And, and they actually smell their footprints. Polar bears, especially females, when, um, when it's time to mate, they, they have stinky feet and the males can walk around on the sea ice and smell footprints and decide if they want to go uh, follow those prints to find the female that's on the other side. So some pretty neat stuff. It seems like that's a pretty creative way in order to be able to find other animals in this really, really dynamic environment. So, uh, so like Elisa says, um, it is mating season for polar bears now. If we want to get to, you know, denning bears and cubs, you have to have mating first. And then you have to have really healthy females too. Uh, females have to be able to eat a bunch. And this is kind of what Anthony was talking about here. They have to be able to go and gorge themselves on, on seals and whatever else they can get their paws on in order to be able to coast in some places like the Southern Hudson Bay through the warm months uh, to make it through to uh to that denning season that could be up to eight months it could be a really long time so so females are mating now and then also just trying to eat as much as they can um through uh through the rest of the sea ice season here uh in the arctic if there happen to be two males oh go ahead sorry lisa oh no you were just about to answer what i was going to ask so you go for it <laughs> Okay, sounds good. And sometimes, you know, <laughs> there could be multiple males that are chasing down the tracks of a female. And this is when things get a little dicey for the males. Males live a pretty hard life out there. They may have to compete to be able to mate with a female. And so this means, in the polar bear world, this means fighting. Now, this picture here, this shows two bears sparring. This is taken outside of mating season. You can see there, actually, you can see a bit of dirt there, maybe some seaweed. So they're still on land. So these bears are actually just kind of warming up, maybe sharpening their skills a little bit, seeing where they fit in in the population. Um, this stuff is just kind of for play, but it gives you an idea of what two male bears might go through in order to uh, gain access to a female. Um, in the actual breeding season, this could be very, very violent. Um, these guys are, what you might say, playing for keeps at that point. And uh, there could be blood, there could be um, you know, broken bones, broken teeth, that sort of thing. So um, oftentimes we can tell older, older males when we're looking at polar bears by scarring on the neck, uh, scarring on the face, things like that. And that can happen through, uh, through breeding season, through the breeding season here and fighting for other males for access to females. Yeah, that sounds like a hard life for males and for females, that's for sure. But they somehow make it work, and then we're lucky enough to see in the spring usually. So we're very fortunate that way. So that must take a lot of energy to 
fight uh, to find food to raise these cubs there's a lot going on in the spring right now but polar bears really they're hoping that they can keep doing that for as long as possible because they're they're going to stay on the sea ice may and hopefully into june but then in some areas across the arctic the sea ice is going to start break up around june july uh, of course depends where we're looking in the arctic there's different sea ice eco regions across the north uh, so different types of sea ice there are nine different polar bear subpopulations and each subpopulation has a slightly different situation with when the sea ice freezes or doesn't freeze uh, or never melts uh, it's all kind of shifting depending on where we look so that's why we talk about specific populations when we have specific findings because we want to be clear about what is happening where but i know for example in western hudson bay where uh polar bears international does a lot of our work and where anthony's heading up this fall hopefully potentially to do some work and where i've worked in the past the sea ice starts to break up usually in july sometimes in june though and that can have ramifications on the polar bear population because even if sea ice breaks up a little bit earlier which has been happening in this region over the past several decades it, it can have impacts on how much polar bears are able to hunt Anthony, I was wondering if you could talk to the audience a little bit about what you know sea ice conditions really mean for polar bears in terms of hunting and what early breakup or shifts in sea ice can mean uh, long term for polar bear populations. Yeah, so you know polar bears they they really start getting um, most active right now in the spring and like like we said they start catching those those seal pups really as soon as they start being born, but it, it's really when those pups um, become start becoming weaned. So after about um, a month or two, um, when they've when they've um, they've really been um, nursing for a longer period of time, and they've um, increased in in their mass and they've gained a lot of, of blubber, and that's when the bears are really able to put on a, a, this huge amount of, of mass, and so it's really that that period, um, particularly in, in the later part of May and then in, in June, when, when the bears can, can really gorge themselves and, and gain this huge amount of weight. And so that really makes that, that, that period um, during that time critical where they need the sea ice, they need to be able to have a stable platform for catching seals. So I mentioned they're, they're hunting when they're when they're digging into the layers, but the, their other hunting method is to basically sit by a seal's breathing hole. It's called still hunting, and they'll wait on a stable piece of ice by the seal breathing hole, breathing hole wait for the seal to, to, to come up to get a breath, and the bears um, will pounce on, on top of them, um, and, and they're able to basically um, catch, catch a seal without having to exert a, a lot of energy. Um, and so if if the sea ice is, is breaking up um, and uh, and there's a lot more open water, it makes it a lot harder for these these bears to, to catch the seals um, and to, to navigate through this environment it means they're having to swim more frequently um, and and um, and not able to um, really um, minimize their their energy expenditure while they're while they're trying to hunt and catch seals. And then on top of that, if if the the there's so much open water. Um, at some point, the bears are, are basically forced onto land, and 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 their 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 feeding season comes to an end. And so, it really can determine, you know, how much body mass and, and weight bears can put on during this this critical period, um, based on what the timing of, of when the sea ice uh, breaks up. What's been found is polar bears really can't can't catch seals in in the open water. There's been very few observations of bears catching seals in the open water and so they're really reliant on the sea ice they essentially use it as their 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 land surface so you know we walk on the land and they they walk on on the ice and use that for for hunting um, and without it the, they they basically are forced to come on to land at some point Thanks for that explanation, Anthony. Yeah, sea ice conditions are so important for polar bears to have a good hunting situation. We're going to play a little video now that kind of explains what's happening to Arctic sea ice and how we can help protect Arctic sea ice and make sure that polar bears roam the sea ice for many years to come. And then we're gonna take a few questions before we start our wrap up. So here's a neat little video about what's going on in the Arctic right now. 
Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels, like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. Yeah, so basically it comes down to we're burning too many fossil fuels, which is trapping heat around our Earth, but we know that the solution is to switch to cleaner energy sources like solar and wind and to push our government leaders for systemic change and make those options more available to us, more available to our children so that we can ensure a better future for all of us, including polar bears. So we're going to take a few questions right now. Thank you so much for sending them in. Uh, first question, Anthony, I'm going to throw over to you. It's from Vicky in Manitoba. Do polar bears eat the whole seal when they catch one, or is there a part that they never eat? That's a great question. Um, so um, what what we typically see with, with um, these bears is that they almost exclusively eat the, the blubber. So um, if they're in, if the bear is in good, good condition and they're able to catch seals, they'll basically um, focus on eating the blubber of the seal and they won't touch pretty much anything else. Um, they'll, they'll basically leave the rest of it on, on the ice and um, Arctic foxes and, and other um, scavengers will come by and, and eat, eat the rest of that. But um, it, uh, most of the time the bears are pretty much exclusively eating the blubber. And Anthony Arlo from Yukon is asking, do killer whales eat polar bears when the polar bears are swimming? Has that ever happened, do you know? Um, so the interesting thing with killer whales, so historically there hasn't been much overlap between killer whales and polar bears. What we're seeing um, more recently with um, these declines in, in sea ice and, and increasing warming temperatures in the Arctic is, is increasing movements of killer whales um, into habitats where polar bears exist. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been documentation of killer whales catching polar bears, but um, like I said earlier, these animals occur in, in really remote environments and there's very few observations of bears in the wild because of the fact that they occur in, in, in such remote areas um, that it's certainly possible um, certainly, if a if a polar bear was swimming in a, in an area with um, with a lot of open water um, where they really didn't have any access to land or sea ice, they um, might be vulnerable to to killer whales. But but yeah, I I haven't actually seen any anyone document um, any any incidents between killer whales and polar bears to this point. It will be very interesting to see what happens in the Arctic as these things continue to shift. Uh, so BJ, throwing a question over to you from Lexi in Alberta. Do polar bear males try to find the same females to mate with every spring? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, uh, I suppose if we dug through the DNA records, um, you'd probably see some overlap there. Um, you know, with uh, populations that are maybe more confined, like the Hudson Bay population, I would I would guess I'm gonna maybe Anthony or Elisa have a have a uh, more information on this, but I would guess it happens from time to time because these bears are essentially kind of in the same kind of bowl. They're in the same habitat, uh, maybe habitat that's a little more open where bears might be able to wander a little bit more. Um, maybe it's less likely that this happens, but um, I would say that uh, males probably select females that are in the same area that they are in uh, and probably don't go venturing across the Arctic uh, looking for the one, you know? I think that's a good point. Yeah, and we should say too, males may mate with several different females in one season. Mm -hmm. And we are learning so much more about the polar bear pedigree, as it's called, now with advances in DNA technology and sequencing, there's so much work that's being done uh, to analyze old samples and build out this kind of mating and genetic profile of all these polar bears, especially in Hudson Bay. So 
very curious to see what we'll find out in the coming years. And we think it's going to teach us a lot about polar bear movements and preferences and breeding and just all sorts of really important things about polar bears that will help us inform better conservation measures for them. So we also had a question from Christina about polar bears in Canada. And yeah, Canada is home to two thirds of the world's polar bears. So there are 19 different subpopulations. Canada manages or co-manages 13 of those. So polar bear very much is a Canadian icon and especially as a Canadian, so thrilled to have so many polar bears. And we have multiple, multiple agencies in Canada working uh, with and for polar bears to help uh, conserve them and understand them and yeah, make sure that they have a healthy living out on that Arctic sea ice. So we are gonna start a wrap up right now. Um, that's all the questions we've seen come in. So we wanted to give you a few interesting points of what's coming up this summer. Uh, first of all, next week is Earth Day. So on April 22nd, Polar Bears International will be celebrating Earth Day. We do have a webcast and we'll have lots of great social media posts. And we know that lots of our partner organizations will be doing the same. And in the summer months, keep an eye out for the beluga whale cams that run in Churchill, Manitoba. But right now you can also see cams in Manitoba. BJ, could you uh, tell the audience quickly about the different cams running right now in Churchill that they can keep an eye on? Absolutely. Northern Lights cam. It's still Northern Lights season in Churchill. Mm -hmm. The bay is mostly frozen. The, the sky is clear. Uh, the nights are still fairly long. So check out the Northern Lights cam. It is spectacular at explore.org. Um, we just put up a brand new camera just the other day. Kyron and Dave, our staff in Churchill, just uh, fired up a raven cam. So we found a raven nest actually right below the Cape Churchill Tower. And, uh, and we put a, net, a camera on that nest. So we will see what happens. This is the first time that this, uh, we've had the Raven cam, of course. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get some experts uh, on the line here to, to talk about Ravens. Um, very neat animals. Uh, and of course the Cape cams will also be uh, running here throughout the spring. This is a live shot right now from Churchill, a beautiful day. Of course, it's still winter up there and the sea ice you can see there on the horizon is still, still present polar bears wandering around out there. Keep an eye on this camera because pretty soon we're gonna start seeing caribou wandering through, potentially here a little bit later, moose, and definitely, as Elisa said, when the ice starts to break up sometime in late June, early July, we'll start to have polar bears wandering through. So keep an eye on all these cameras. Yeah, they're really a great tool to see what's going out uh, live around Churchill. And another tool that helps us see what's going on is our Polar Bears International Bear Tracker, which you can access through our website. Go see where some polar bears right now are that are being tracked as they walk throughout Hudson Bay, as they hunt, as they mate, as they do polar bear things until they come back to land. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for caring about polar bears. If you'd like to learn more ways to get involved, uh, please do check out our website. There's all sorts of activities, lessons, ideas, ways that we can all work together to help protect polar bears and their sea ice home. Thank you to BJ and thank you to Anthony for joining us today. And thank you for all your questions. And hopefully we will see you next week on Earth Day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.